Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap. I'm really excited about this one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we'll be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's kick off today's webinar, which is the developer's new normal, quality and security by design. Our speakers today are Jeffrey Martin, who is a VP of product at WhiteSource, and Marcus Merrill, who is Senior Director of Field Services at Sauce Labs. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. It's always Thank fun to much. be here. It's great to all be right, here. all right. Well, hey, uh, guys, I know you have a great presentation on tap. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, let you guys get into it, but I'll be on the back end if you need me. Just holler. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, yeah. So like Charlene just introduced us, right? I'm Jeff Martin, uh, he's Marcus. Uh, kind of let's get into it. Sure, absolutely. All right, so I thought it would be helpful if before we kind of really got into the, the meat, we talked a little bit about <laughs> essentially what is DevOps and how, how things are changing. What is this new normal we're talking about? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot going on here, but I mean, Marcus, maybe do you have like a good, What's your definition, what's your description, if you will, of the changes that are happening and what we kind of DevOps, uh, as we call it? I think you, you froze up there. Oh, really? Can you hear me now? So the, the uh, what, what I see happening with, sorry, you're there? I am. Great. Um, what I see happening with the, in our space, and we, Sauce Labs covers the functional testing space. and we what we are seeing a lot is people asking to move testing earlier into the cycle because testing at the late point uh, that that it's traditionally been done tends to be slow and a little bit error prone and also holiday. They're trying to move it earlier into the process so that it's a smoother process overall and have it be done by essentially the same brain trust as the people who are actually developing the software itself. So. We're trying to, to move earlier, move faster, and move more consistently. And suppose, so an, one example would be, we have a lot of customers who run a thousand tests once a week. We would rather them run a hundred tests every hour or 50 tests every hour, something that would give them a constant pulse and feedback information uh, earlier and more consistently. Yeah, and I, I mean, that ties in directly to how I kind of usually describe this, right? Which is bringing the activities that are usually done later in the cycle. Um, in your case, functional testing. Uh, what we do at White Source is more security. Um, things that are usually done post even build, maybe traditionally. Um, and yeah. instead of having them only on the right hand side in that typical model, right. shifting all of these risk mitigation pieces to the left to be smaller, more iterative, and closer to the actual development time um, for a bunch of different reasons. But I mean, there's a few really big ones we'll go into in a second. Um, but, you know, was there anything else you wanted to kind of highlight here before, I, as I set this baseline? No? All right. Sounds good. So, I mean, what this boils down to for Critical the issues, purpose. And I'm, I'm having some trouble here. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it me? Or? Um, no, Marcus, so I think it might be on your side. Why don't so, I turn um, off my webcam? And yeah, I was we'll, going to say, why don't you do that? Try that. Perfect. It's speaking about tips for the new normal, right? Um, right. <laughs> different kind of new normal. But, um, <laughs> um, but, you know, look, ultimately what we're trying to do here is to give your developers more insight, more control, and to be closer to these risk mitigation pieces. You know, we're focused on security and quality, respectively. Um, but the idea is that shifting these things more to the left gives everybody better insight 
and is much, much less expensive, um, both in terms of distraction, in terms of the results, and just pure money. So, you know, this is something that I think we all realize, but I do want to really highlight that it's not just shifting left, it's really more expanding left. The traditional right-hand model, and I'll flip back here, this typical model, it's not quite just stop doing it there and do it here on the left-hand side earlier. It's really embedding these activities across everything. So uh, Marcus, I'm going to hope you're, you're back on the <laughs> technical uh, problems here, but uh, did you maybe want to highlight a few pieces here about how test cycles through the entire SDLC? It's okay. We we may be having some technical difficulties with Marcus here. Um, yeah, we'll try and get that figured out on on our side. So keep 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 right on rolling, Jeff. Hey, fair enough. <laughs> so fortunately, I, I know both of these pretty well. Um, look, realistically, like I highlighted already, both security testing and functional testing are not inherently all that different. Essentially, you're running a check to make sure that either there's no security vulnerability present or that the application functions as intended. Those two activities are best done in every phase. Um, so it's a little bit of a misnomer to talk about shift left. We think of it that way because that's the motion that we're going through, but realistically it is expanding. And anybody who says, you know, you don't need to do all of the post-deployment, for instance, pieces, um, or you know, while you're doing your release, um, and, you, know, you can just do it when you're doing coding, um, is it, sort of misleading a little bit. It does have to be inside every phase, and that sentence alone creates a whole bunch of new challenges um, that we've been struggling with for about a decade as we shift things over, um, but nowadays it's getting much, much more prevalent as applications have a gigantic increasing need to both function at an unbelievably good level to be, give people really great user experience and security is becoming this incredibly important piece both with regulations but also just customer expectations of you know I expect you to have ISO certs and I expect you to have a secure product that protects my information so All right, that's a little bit of preamble and me setting a baseline. Um, I do want to tie that directly into the why. Here is why we actually care about doing this. Um, I'm actually going to start completely unintuitively in the bottom right, because the ultimate goal of all this, like I just talked about, is satisfying your customers. Um, you know, in the product world, we talk a lot about things like wow moments and giving people experiences they don't um, forget. Being able to say not just, do I have a good product? Does it work? But does it actually make people happy? Does it solve the problem they're trying to solve in the easiest, best way? Um, two giant handicaps to satisfaction would be, of course, if things are not functioning correctly, but also um, if you're giving away people's data. Uh, or you have security holes. Uh, people need that assurance that things are secure and that they work. So, um, Marcus, it sounds like you're back. I think I'm back. You are. I can hear you. All right, great. I'm gonna I'm on a wired connection now, not a wireless. Evidently, this is a problem all over the house. So, apologize. That's fine. That's how it goes, right? New normal. Yeah, exactly. Ah, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> Apologies for having a second. the new normal. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I literally just like clicked away for a second. And I don't know what happened. Anyways, we're back. I'm back. Um, so, Marcus, I was highlighting some of the business yeah. benefits of this risk tool chain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe that's a good place for you to jump in. Um, can you explain what we mean by the risk tool chain? Yeah, I think that for a long time, it, you know, for my entire career, software, something like 20-ish years, We've been talking about functions. Uh, I am a developer, I make software, I develop features. 
Uh, I'm a tester. I make sure that the developer didn't break anything. Uh, I'm a product person. I try to make sure that the user, you know, that that you know the feature is designed in a way that that will benefit my business. But what all of these activities have in common is the concept of risk and the idea that everything you do is introducing a point of uncertainty and uh, and you know potentially uh, you know good or bad things to your business. And to me, we need to stop looking at things in terms of the function you're performing and more look at the things in terms of what is the benefit or the risk to my business and to the user if I get these things wrong or right. Uh, if I, you know, if I'm, if I'm testing software, I shouldn't be looking to see if there are, you know, typos in here unless it affects <laughs> my, my, you know, if it affects legal copy, then there's a risk element there because maybe I could get sued if I phrase this incorrectly. Uh, but to me, all of these activities tie to risk and we don't talk about that openly. We, we seem to, Executives talk about that openly all the time. Yes. At the ground level, when we're writing code, when we're testing software, we don't talk about risk. And I think that we should. It's it's infused throughout the entire conversation from the left to the right, all the way through this process at some level. And our job shouldn't be thought of as finding errors or finding security flaws as much as managing, identifying, mitigating, preventing risk. And I think it's important to keep in mind just the basic definition of risk. Yeah. which is some impact times its likelihood. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. is fundamental to how DevOps actually ties in to risk management inside of this tool chain. And, you know, without getting too far down here, the reason we're spending some time talking about the business benefits is because all of the pieces that really we have trouble with as an industry and all of the tips we have to share tie in to some of these business benefits, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Realistically, the, the problems people have are really just obstacles to realizing these benefits. Yeah. So Absolutely. the easiest one is high confidence in new releases, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as a product person, um, I think I've had, <laughs> I might've had about two dozen different products at this point in my life. Um, realistically, one of the biggest problems when you release a product is the confidence you have, yeah. not just for your customers, but even for your internal salespeople or you know internal customers. The only way to get high confidence is to know that you've mitigated the risk to the appropriate level. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, that, and that ties into both functional and security, of course, right? You, know, you obviously want some very high confidence on security, um, but that is not a one size fits all piece. It's a lot different if you're handling credit card information than if you're a video game. Yeah, it just is. Exactly. Um. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, I think that that um, there's there's a lot of tools that have been introduced in the last few years that help us to measure that stuff uh, before and after we release. So, you know, ten years ago, we were just starting to get into the conversation about user analytics. And yeah. now it's a natural part of every business where we are able to examine the journey that the users are taking through our software in order to find out whether or not we were correct when we said, hey, feature users would love it if we introduce this. Well, now we can know within minutes of shipping, did they actually start using it or did it <laughs> fundamentally break something or did our cart checkout flow lift go down because we introduced something that they didn't like that we thought they would like. So tooling has helped us a lot it still involves a lot of uh human interaction human uh you know to me the ai is useful for helping us measure this stuff it's not yet good at helping us predict so and i um, think that ties in kind of to one of the other circles here which is open discussion yeah because at the end of the day even though we talk a lot about automation um results have to be interpreted yeah. they have to be tied to the business values this requires humans until we get ai to the point where they can replace people like you and me <laughs> and um, <laughs> scary thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you know that this testing earlier and basically moving it earlier into smaller pieces really, really helps having a discussion about each piece of your risk mm -hmm. and informs that discussion with actual data instead of people guessing. Um, I think it's actually one of the biggest highlights of having a really robust risk tool chain 
-hmm. is that that risk tool chain facilitates earlier, smaller, and more productive discussions amongst mm -hmm. the actual humans. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and and hopefully it facilitates uh, earlier and and more granular, smaller features that you can release iteratively at a time. Like w when I first came into software, well, I was in gaming, so we did releases every two years. But <laughs> eventually, it was it was I worked for a company that wasn't a game company, and we would re release software every six months, and that was revolutionary to me. Now we're releasing software every two weeks. If you're Amazon, every eight seconds. So, <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and it ties directly into the left-hand side here, which mm -hmm. we purposely kind of put together. Uh, speed of delivery and failing early, failing often. Um, I, I always love highlighting how important it is to fail yeah. because it's, I don't know, it's almost a cliche now, but uh, it really is important. Uh, you mm -hmm. need to be, able, you're going to screw up. <laughs> Just fundamentally, risk mitigation is not risk elimination. Right. There are things you miss. And, um, and that's, the, the other thing that I love about what's happening now in software is that we are designing rollback strategies into our tool chain through the advent of things like feature flags and, and stuff like that. But more, more importantly than the actual tooling is the, the conversation that we have that we say we say within, you know, within minutes of shipping, we're going to be monitoring this, this and this signal from the analytics piece. Mm -hmm. So we will know, should we roll that back? If we do roll that back, we will know exactly how to roll it back, and we won't have to sit there running running multiple bash scripts over and over and over again, doing a you know a rollback to a previous commit. Like you have all that ready before you ship the software now. Yeah, and, and I think it's, seen, yeah, and it, it feeds right back into all the other pieces, right? Which is okay. yes, our goal is customer satisfaction, but at the end of the day, um, unless you're you know unbelievably good at your job, you will mess up sometimes. I think my favorite boss ever actually put it as the only way to never fail is to not do anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, you can't drive customer satisfaction by doing nothing. So that means you will fail. You have to be accepting of the fact you'll fail, but you want to fail in the right way. You want to fail quickly. Um, you want to be able to undo <laughs> yeah, the impact. You want, yeah, you want a plan B. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. All right. So I think we've hammered home the business benefits here. We're going to tie them right back in. Um, there are some just blatant operational benefits as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is something, I mean, I'm going to let you lead on this because I, I know you're passionate about things like constant iterative improvements. Constant iterative improvements and, and also things like, you know, dependency checking. Um, in, in my in my case, it gets as, as a, you know, to the point of unit testing because I've worked at a company where, uh, several actually, where they did not do unit testing. And then one at one point it was, it was imposed as a mandate and everyone hated it, everyone grumbled. But then after about a week, two weeks doing the work and actually doing doing well at it, the whole dev organization changed. Within, I'd say three months, we were a transformed group because suddenly we didn't view unit tests as like you know eating your vegetables. It was more like, I'm going to do a little bit of work now, several minutes of work to write a unit test to make sure that the test, I, the, the code I just wrote is is secure and, and hammered down and, and actually, you know, tight. And that few minutes will make sure that any other developer who touched this code, including myself at a future date, uh, will have confidence that if all the unit tests pass, we are, we are in a good state. And I think that it kind of ties directly into what we do too, right? And to me, the one of the most important bullets here is actually the zero rework. Yeah. Um, so at White Source, we specialize in open source risk management, uh, yeah. both security and legal. And what you do not want to do is use some piece of open source that's, I don't know, GPL licensed. You get all the way through your deployment cycle, and then you find out, oh, crud, legal says we can't use this. We have to go back and replace that library. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of extra rework that can be prevented very, very easily by just checking that very early. <laughs> <laughs> um, same thing with, you know, I accidentally used an old version of a library that has seven critical vulnerabilities and is exposing me to a significant amount of risk. You do not want to find that out later on and then have to update it and worry about all the functional um, problems that updating a library a few major versions would cause. You want to know that early. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's these tie together because the more rework you have to do for security or licensing reasons, the more functional problems you end up having to retest. Mm -hmm. 
And mm -hmm. so this rework kind of snowballs out into an entire another run of right. your risk mitigation strategies. Yeah, I mean, um, ask any Java developer who's been who's had to keep up over the last two years from the move to Java 8 to now, I think we're on 15 is just shipped. I think and so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. They're, they're talk about constant iterative improvements, or, or at least iterations. I'm not sure if it's improvements, but um, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, look, that's really what this boils down to: is your culture needs to shift to enable quick re, sorry, risk um, mitigation early mm -hmm. to eliminate all the rework that, frankly, nobody wants to do anyways. Like yeah. I've never heard a developer really thrilled about the idea of updating stuff. I, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's not fun. Yeah, it's not fun, and, and also it's, you know, if, if you don't do it, it seems like if you don't do it right from the beginning, then it's it's a constant thing. It's not just something you go and it, it's a it's a constant rework. I mean, if you if you're dealing with a legacy product that's a you know mono repo with millions of lines of code, I mean, it's it's just it's never ending. And it's that's funny when too. It's, we yeah. know this intuitively. I, I, I have kids. I just was like teaching them how to clean, and <laughs> you know, I did not suggest to them that they clean the house once a year, right? It's like no, if you clean your room for five minutes every like few days, it's a lot easier to handle. <laughs> right, so. and and usually, you know, when you're talking about cleaning once a year, you at some point, you what you never do is say, well, the house is too dirty. Let's move out and get another house. Right. Where in software, <laughs> we, I, I, you know, how many times have you been involved in a project where they just make the decision to burn it down and rewrite it, and therefore lose two or three years of, pro of market momentum? Um, I, I've worked for several companies who make that decision, and sometimes it works if they spend, if they, you know, budget it and estimate it, and then they double all those numbers, and then, you know, it, it, it sometimes works out, but most of the time it, it doesn't work out, and uh, yeah. so. If we, if only, and we if you knew. and if you don't have the culture and the habits, the yeah. same thing will just happen to the next house. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really beating that analogy to death. I just love doing that. <laughs> Probably keep going with it. Man. Oh, yo, you could totally good. <laughs> Hiring a cleaning crew, we can That's keep right. going for a while. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So. Cool. All right. So here's the here's the part I really like. I was trying to get to because I think this is the most important part, um, which is, all right, how. How do we realize all these benefits? How do we get to this point? Um, maybe many of you on the call here have started this journey and you're running into things. Um, there are obstacles to realizing these benefits, even if you know what the goals are and even if you're trying. Um, so here's our, I don't know, six tips. Right. I don't know why I'm having trouble counting, but six tips <laughs> um, for basically how to do this correctly. I always how to do this mostly correct. I'll say it that way. I don't want to put us as the uh, be all end all here. Um, right. From our sure. experience. Right. So, um, you know, Marcus, maybe I'll, I'll do you want to start with one? Yeah, I'll let you pick. I'm I, I mean, I'm always a fan of the champion. I, I, I also think it comes to the caveat that, you know, heroism can lead to, you know, if there's only one person who's the champion and they don't have a successor, then if they quit, they it goes away right so that's you, know, you need a champion in, usually in the form of a, an executive sponsor but there needs to be some some amount of um the champion needs to take some responsibility for making sure that if they're not there one day the, the work continues <laughs> yeah so, i think we've all seen that where somebody maybe an executive puts down a mandate um mm -hmm. and you know oh, oh, six months later he's switched to a new company and You've got a new boss who, you know, didn't make that mandate and doesn't care as much about it. So you start process changes and you stop them. Right, right, right. Um, and realistically, you need to have somebody on the ground who is driving that. Um, but it's really helpful to have more than one just in case. Like, yeah. honestly, it, it, it but you don't make culture change without at least one person really driving it and just hammering home and being kind of a jerk about <laughs> making sure it's in every pit, every place, right? That's right. That's right. Um, like you said, you gave that example of um, just a few minutes ago, right? Of making that switch and it was painful at first. You yeah. have to have somebody pushing through the pain. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, if you have people who have been on projects like that before and they've seen the light, then maybe they can tell the story about the transformational confidence you get 
when you make a process improvement like this and just say, all right, just bear with me for a few weeks. Let's get this done. Um, right. It'd be tough. And, you know, fundamentally, I, I think we all, again, sort of intuitively know this, but it can be hard to um, identify that champion or volunteer to be that champion because you get pushback and it's something you have to push through. Yeah. Um, yeah. But fundamentally, so, look, if it's not tied to business, business, actual business values at some point, it won't happen. Companies, right. uh, companies above a startup level need to have all the things they're actually driving towards be associated somehow to a business benefit, which is why we just spend so much time talking about the business benefits. <laughs> right. So it's interesting to me that we've got, and I think, you know, this is deliberate. We've got champion and then we have changes start at the bottom which those to me could be contradictory but they're they're not in that a champion isn't enough you know yeah. the person the, the the team the squad that is you know eight eight developers learning to write unit tests together being held to a standard by the champion they're the ones who are going to implement the patterns and processes and cultural precedent that will allow the rest of the organization to adopt it. It won't all come from the champion. So these two go together because you have to have a champion, but you also need everyone on board in order to push that upwards in order to say, we, at the code level, we understand how important this is. And at the code level, we're mitigating and identifying risk, not doing some work and then letting someone else evaluate, hey, what are the risks in here? No, no, we're doing it at the ground level. And, 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 and I think that's actually a really good point because the two failure points I see most often is there's nobody leading it, nobody championing it, there's no tying to business values, but the developers have worked in organizations before maybe, or they, you know, they do understand the value of doing all this early, they're trying to eliminate rework. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's just the bottom, uh, it ends up being sidelined a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other failure is it's just the top and, you know, it, it comes across to the developers as, oh, geez, our executive read a book uh, or went to a webinar <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's top down doesn't work great. Bottom up doesn't work great. You need to have both. Um, and that can be hard to accomplish, but it is getting more common, I think, as, as these changes spread throughout the industry. My boss read a book. That's... That's, oh. I, I felt that one right here. <laughs> I, I, I think all of us have had that moment where like, yeah. you know, you're having a meeting with your boss and he suddenly goes, so I was reading the other day, I read this article and you just almost immediately want to like run out the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's good. I shouldn't say that. Like I had a great one the yeah, other day sure. with my boss, but still like mm, cringe inducing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh I think it probably at our level, the director AVP level, where where some of those really, you know, pervasive I, I, bad ideas come from. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest, I've definitely been the guy who said, well, I, I read this interesting article or I saw this case study. And uh, yeah, sometimes it come, brings you out of yourself for a second going, oh, geez, I used to hate it when people did this to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But of course, I'm always right. So it's OK. <laughs> well, it's interesting also because because the you know we, we we've seen a lot in in just in the functional testing industry that that there's uh, there's several movements and schools of thought and several uh, almost uh, they they get to the point where they're almost religious uh, ideas yeah. about how you should and how you shouldn't test. Um, there's the whole checking versus testing debate. There's the whole uh, context. B D D. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 things that that. You know, I have, it's one of those things where it's like, I'll go in and I'll have my own opinions and people want to hear the opinion, but also recognizing that, well, some people do pull this off and it's fine. So I'm not going to just go in there and tell them it's wrong. You know? So it's, uh, yes. you know, my, my assumption, Jeffrey, is that when you go and say, I read an article, you're going to be open and say, all right, let's just give this, let's time box this, give it a couple of days. If it doesn't work, let's move on. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely not. I'm a total jerk. No, uh, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> I think this ties into the next piece, right? Which is yeah. communication. Like this is one of those underpinnings that can be very, very hard to describe how when it works well, um, but you know when it doesn't work right. <laughs> and that's what it is, right? Uh, just to tie it into what we were talking about before. Like, I hope at least if I'm like, hey, I read this article, I'm not making a dictation, uh, you know, and I have a pattern of, having good ideas that have worked out 
so people you know listen and we have a real communication and i listen to what their feedback is mm -hmm. um a large chunk of the benefits really depend on opening up this communication between the different stakeholders. And we're not just talking execs and developers here. We're talking between development teams. We're talking between the development team and your QA people, between mm -hmm. your, your QA people and your security guy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because every team is structured differently, the communication patterns are different, but they need to be open and they need to be truthful to develop yeah. the trust that lets you get all these benefits. That's where, it, to me, that that the, the whole model. And we could go for an hour on this, but the whole model of servant leadership, and and uh, you know, leadership showing vulnerability to build trust, to me, is critical in being able to build up these kinds of relationships between teams and and between management and uh, and and the people doing the work. Um, so I, I don't want to go too far off of that, but but I mean that's. Um, I did want to ask a, a peripheral point, though. In your experience, mm -hmm. you we you, you've probably seen this transition from uh, dev team of 40 people, QA team of I don't know 10, 15 yeah. people, probably not as many as it should be, and then there's <laughs> and then there's a squad of product people, I don't know how many, five to ten probably, and this has shifted over the last five or six years to the what we're called what i'm calling the spotify model they they put out a big paper about tribe skilled quad sorry tribe guild squad <laughs> it's early and That's and uh, and so so uh have you seen this transition help with building communication and trust between teams yes and and fundamentally it just makes sense um the less direct handovers you have the less formality, for lack of a better word, it's still formal, I shouldn't say it that way, but the less mm -hmm. um, handoff it is, right? Yeah. The old school between waterfall and agile. Yeah. Uh, breaking down the barriers between the teams helps you break down the barriers between communication. Yeah. And you may have specialists because that's how the world works and nobody can understand everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, I always laugh when somebody tells me they have a scrum team and everybody in there is full stack. I'm like, okay, sure, but somebody's your database guy. Uh, yeah, somebody's your somebody's your UI person. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like you, you have specialties, and that's good, but you know you do need to be able to say, okay, yes, maybe we have a person who specializes in automation for functional tests, and maybe we have a person who specializes in understanding security concerns, but that knowledge they're just an expert available to everybody it's everybody's responsibility right. um and when you break when you make it everybody's responsibility you basically force people to communicate and naturally teams tend towards communicating truthfully if they're all in the same boat <laughs> when you create different incentives is where you get um tilted and biased data right um, if you if you pay your QA people by the number of bugs they find, uh, you're going to have your QA people find a lot of bugs, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, so it's it does tie in a lot to structure and incentives, and a lot of that is frankly top down structuring. It's not usually teams self organizing, right. um, so it's important uh, again to have that champion. It's funny to think about that uh, being paid by the number of bugs you find, considering the risk conversation, because you're going to get 500 bugs, 497 of which are almost zero risk to your business. Exactly. It's, it creates so, bad risk mitigation because you remove the likelihood piece of your risk mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. basically almost remove impact as well. Yeah. <laughs> so suddenly you're just trying to measure problems instead of measuring risk. Right. Um, the same thing does happen in security. Um, you know, there's a ridiculous amount of security vulnerabilities in the world, it's increasing. Mm -hmm. Um, especially as open source usage increases, you have more and more public vulnerabilities. Um, but the fact of the matter is vulnerabilities are not all made equal. And yep. you can say you want to focus and remediate and fix all of them. But in reality, that's incredibly hard. And realistically, a lot of them don't have any real impact. So being able to have that communication between teams does depend on having good data, but it also depends on making sure that everybody's aligned. <laughs> right yeah and you know it's, it's it's interesting also that that um there's security is where i learned the distinction between priority and severity 
in, yes. in, a, in a defect. Um, security is where, where you can learn that and teach it. And it also, I think it helps with building communication between teams because you build these things into your process, these ways of communicating. I found a bug once that was a severity zero. This will bring down the system. It was a priority five because you had to be inside the firewall doing a certain action that only three people with access had. They didn't, <laughs> the, the developers did not intend for this to be a vulnerability, but since only three people in the world in theory had the access to do it. Okay. It, right. Yeah. Priority. So severity zero. Yeah. It'll kill the system. Priority five. We're never going to fix this. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so, it's, there is one last piece of communication I want to highlight because it's yeah. uh, my part, right? We do product. The other piece that is actually kind of important, especially for risk mitigation, is for the people who do your planning and decide what you're going to build to say why. Mm -hmm. Because the why dictates the risk. Um, you know, if we're, <laughs> some of it's obvious if you're building a new e commerce platform, okay, you, you kind of know what the risks are, especially from security. But some of it is not. You're adding a new feature. It's important to say, okay, we're doing this so that the customer experience is, you know, X amount better. You know, we're trying to cut the performance in half because we have some people complaining the performance isn't is incorrect. So if you know the why, that actually can inform your impact and that changes your risk. Um, yeah. It's just a part of communication that's very often forgotten about as yeah. DevOps teams try to just talk amongst themselves and kind of forget about the business purpose of what they're working on. Right. It's my it's my fond hope as as testers that to me testers ought to be best friends with product people. Traditionally, yes. they've been best friends with developers, even if adversarial. Still, very well close. put. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I think that you know as you're talking about the why and here's the lift we need to see. I as a tester should be thinking what are the signals we need to build into the system to be able to measure whether or not it worked, and yeah. how can I make sure that those signals actually emit the right signal when it does or doesn't work. And how can I report back to product? We are, we are very confident that not only do we have all the checks in places and that the feature functions like you think it should, but that we know within a day or so, we will know how to say, did it work or not? And, and, and I think that's a really important piece kind of to tie into the next two that we have because they're really related. Yeah. Which is, I mean, the, the, the last thing I wanted to do is come on the webinar and say, you need to communicate more in order to break down barriers because everyone says that that's in every book, every article. Yes. I want to give people, I mean, we're, we're here talking about tactics in some cases. Here's a thing you can do, build in signals. So yes, autonomous. very clearly. And that means it should be, uh, look, of course, automated. I think that's the most obvious piece on this <laughs> slide, right. honestly, right? Um, uh, yeah, you can't do anything at speed if it's not automated. Humans mm -hmm. are slow. They're also error prone. Mm -hmm. um, at least theoretically, a code will execute the same way every time. So it's reliable, it's scalable, and it's repeatable. Yeah. Um, I think that's the easy part. Autonomous is the one that I think we should probably delve into a little bit more because I, I think people might not understand what that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it ties directly into what you were talking about with data. So maybe I'll let you continue on that piece. Well, I mean, autonomous, I guess you could look at it several different ways. What what I what I tend not to try to do is have, you know, try to build a system that will self-figure out, mm. self-determine the intent that the human was going after. More for me, it's that if I introduce a change into the system, the system will know how to incorporate that without intervention. So I put a code change in, I make a commit, I push the commit to GitHub or whatever. Sure. And another system picks it up, incorporates it, runs tests, incorporates it into the broader thing, runs tests. So to me, the, the, the autonomous piece is as little intervention as possible. How can I build efficiencies into my pipeline so that I can get from keyboard to production with as little time as possible? Uh, yes. I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> More or less. And actually, I mean, there's some other aspects in there too. Like you do want to try to make things not as dependent on each other. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, sure. You know, you, you try to create things that are a little bit severable um, mm -hmm. and importantly, communicate the data in severable ways. Yeah. Um, you know, so that you do have a measurement of your security risk versus functional risk 
um, versus heck legal risk, uh, you know, in the world of open source. Those are different aspects of risk. And if I've seen people try to blend them together too often. Um, yeah. the, the systems all have to work together and they have to be autonomous, but the data also has to be autonomous. Right, um, right. Uh, or right. you can't feed the data incorrectly, basically, so that you can continually improve. Yeah. Um, and of course, that, that involves building a lot of asynchronous systems that are, you know, talking talking to each other kind of independently so that there's not a single breakage in the chain. It, 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 it makes the system complicated, but once you've got it done, it could be beautiful. Exactly. And, and that's sort of what I was getting at. Yes. Everybody wants to start with something easy and they just do like a base, a basic flow and they try to have everything as gates um, in a serial line. But realistically, you can't either hit the speed or you can't hit the data you need unless it's interdependent, but reports separately. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and importantly, that also means that you have to basically take this results and do something with it. It's This is the part mm -hmm. where I think people forget. Um, they don't go back. They don't learn and go back and update their, you know, policies on security or, or legal for open source. Mm -hmm. And they don't update their automated tests to, you know, <laughs> actually yeah. catch things that matter um, mm -hmm. as they learn more about what matters. Yeah. I mean, we, at, at one of the companies I worked for, we we're running a, you know, e-commerce site, huge, huge deal uh, to make sure that certain aspects of the system performed. We had written something like, I don't know, 800 tests, maybe it's more like 200, that, that covered this one area of the test that lets users uh, customize their avatars, enter their email address, customize their messaging, kind of a very small social media aspect to the site. And at some point, someone asked me casually in the hallway, not in a meeting, not in a formal way, yep. why are you doing so much testing on that? Only 1% of our users ever look at it. You have fewer tests that operate on our main search page which is where 97 percent of our revenue comes from what's the deal that changed my career honestly that that conversation yeah. probably happened in 2012 because i started asking questions about what is important to our users not only about functional coverage of the site um but also about some you know recognizing the unfortunate fact that a lot of people are still using ie 11 because they can't change out of it so how do we introduce cross-platform and cross-browser testing based on the actual usage of our system? And if a certain browser combination drops below 0.5% of usage, then we can let it go. But using analytics like that in order to inform how we go about doing our testing, uh, it's critical. And, and it's not done nearly enough, at least in my profession. And that's one of the, the things I've been preaching for years is connecting yeah. the user signals back to what we do earlier in the pipeline in order to ensure that we are at keeping an eye on what the money wants in our business. Absolutely. It, it ties right actually right over into security as well. If you're yeah. worrying about an avatar system, right, and you're using some open source software to manage, I don't know how it looks, that is definitely something that has a lower priority than, you know, inside your user signups yeah. <laughs> where they're sending their password. Right, right. Or managing credit cards to your earlier point. Uh, yes. Yeah. I was trying to use a different one just because I'm like credit cards, everybody gets it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, but yeah, you, I mean, you're handling personal information. Yeah. yeah. PII nowadays is, I mean, yeah. privacy and security are two sides of the same coin. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, look, I think we kind of talked a lot about this already, but it's just sort of a reminder that there are these different groups and cutting down these barriers using these tips does matter. Um, but I did want to just kind of briefly mention that open source is an increasingly large amount of your uh, software. Um, our own stats have it as somewhere, depending on the language and depending on what the application is, uh, 60 to 80 percent, frankly, on the higher end there, um, mm -hmm. of most code is open source, which means a huge chunk of your functional problems are actually in there. Almost all of the important security problems are in there, um, and you know, hopefully you don't have legal problems with your own proprietary code. Uh, <laughs> that, that other leg of risk. Hopefully um, you're keeping an eye on so, the licenses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the licenses is usually an open source only problem, mm -hmm. um, but it does mean that a lot of this is more about how things fit together than mm -hmm. it is about how the code works. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's 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 a much better world, I think. 
that we live in now than the world 20 years ago where you had to pay a company a huge amount of money just to get your dev suite up and running. Yeah. Because if you've ever had to call them for support, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a nightmare and you can't be sure that they're going to ship the patch that you need. Like anything. So in open source, you can download the code, you can look at it yourself, you can alter it the way you want. It's great. Uh, but yes, at the same time, it does introduce different kinds of risk. So yeah, it's, it's just a matter of accounting for that. And, and it's great. We've had these, you know, we've had tools like Dependabot. GitHub is doing these things where it will alert you that that uh, not only is your is your Maven file made up of dependencies that are out of date, but we just found a security flaw in there was a security flaw flaw <laughs> located in this version of this library. You need to go swap it out, or better yet, we'll do it for you. Yeah, we're we're, we're actually powering that, so I'm very familiar. Awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because that's that's what we do is basically a, a, you know open source risk management. But I I like highlighting it that it's an increasing amount of your code because it means that from a risk management perspective, um, you know, open source is a good place to start. And look, that's also where public vulnerabilities come from, right? Yeah. Very few proprietary public vulnerabilities. Yeah. So yeah. I do just want to kind of close off here with two more big points before we, we wrap up. Um, one, look, this is sort of ties into all this. At the end of the day, even if you're using open source or third party components that you're purchasing, you can depend on their quality to a degree. You can depend on their security to a degree. But ultimately, you have your own policies, you have your own company, your own purpose, your own business needs. Um, and it's on you to make sure that the vulnerabilities aren't there and that your quality is to a point that it enables just a flawless user experience, right? We all are in the business now of making users happy. And yeah. You know, it's just because you're using open source doesn't mean that automatically happens. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to redefine this from minimum viable product to minimum lovable product. We want people to be delighted when they use it. Because like, I, I love that phrase, actually. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, uh, we talked about games briefly earlier. To me, unless you're making a game, in general, I'm not sure people really want to use your software. They want to get in, they want to get the job done, they want to get out. And they want to remember it yeah. fondly. And if they have a bad experience, especially on mobile, they might not open the app again, you know? So how often has that happened? <laughs> I mean, people use an application to solve a problem. Yeah. And ideally, they, you solve that problem in a nice, easy, the least amount of obstacles way, creating this flawless experience where yeah. you've helped them solve their problem and now they can move on with their day and do whatever it is they want to do. Right, which is why, you know, I've, I've gone on a campaign for years to get rid of the little tiny radio button that you have to move the mouse over. Just like target practice, <laughs> click that tiny little thing. And it's just, you just, I mean, Mark Twain said, a classic is a book everyone wants to have read. Yes, yes. And that's uh, what people want <laughs> out of your software. They want to have moved through it and, and <laughs> remembered it fondly, uh, that, they, that it helped them get the job done. And I think that... Uh, this can be done. Like there's tooling, the UI front ends are getting better and better all the time. Sure. And our ability to measure whether or not people are successful in their journey through our software is, is getting better and better all the time. And user experience has correlations outside of purely um, like the application itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think Facebook, for instance, did itself any favors with the whole Cambridge Analytica thing where that actually harmed user experience but it was a fundamentally a security and privacy issue. Yeah, right, um, right. So these things do matter. You know, I don't trust software that has big breaches to trust my credit card information to, just to go back to my crutch there. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, that's, uh, it's very fundamental to user experience. Yeah, yeah. All Absolutely. right. I, I purposely made sure we left some time for this one because I just like it. Uh, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna let you read this one on expanding, right? <laughs> because I know you're real passionate on it. I've already touched on it a little bit. And, and so to me, just to, to put a finer point on it, is is the expanding right, shifting right, whatever you want to put it. Um, yeah, I like expand right because we've already used the word shift, right? Yeah. Um, it means watching out for the actual user journey. And we have a hypothesis at, at Sauce that, that it's what happens after you ship that is, it's honestly more important that than what happens before like if you if you are moving to the left you're working on operational efficiency you're working on making sure that your processes are smooth that you don't have spikes in your timelines you're managing risk you're mitigating risk you're trying to make predictions 
But once you move some of your monitoring and, and application and, uh, processes to the right post-release, things like, uh, well, feature flags come in post-release because you've got code that's in production that's not switched on. And that already gives you a, a good signal about whether or not that code just by existing has broken anything, then you turn it on. And, you, and if by having created a feature flag, you can turn it off and roll that feature back. So the idea that once you're in production, you can you can control what the users see a little bit better, and you can also measure the signal and then feed that back into the product cycle. We have, so we're we're trying to talk to our customers about feedback loops at the production level, and then at the test level, at the dev level, and at the product level. All these feedback loops, like you you know, had this Mobius strip here. So when yeah, so, so I mean, that's, that's essentially what we mean by shift right, is how do we keep an eye on the signals that our users are sending us and let that drive the changes we need to make in the future to the product? I mean, absolutely. Like, look, we just talked a lot about how things have changed and the new normal is very, you know, expanded to the left. And I think, you know, when we think about what's, what's coming next, where's the next shift happening? it's going to be more towards the right. Like, I love the Mobius strip little infinity symbol here because it actually shows where the breakage is. Yeah. It looks like it continues forever, but, you know, it's two-dimensional, and there's actually a line between monitor and plan. And mm -hmm. breaking down that barrier is the next step for a couple yeah. of reasons. But one is we are getting better about tying in business value, which is a post-release realized thing, yeah. Yeah. into your risk mitigation and bringing that into your risk tool chain. Mm -hmm. um, and then also it should inform, it's part of what happens to create that culture of continuous improvement. Yeah. Um, you know, risk doesn't stop when you put the thing out the door. It actually increases. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't go down, it goes up. Right. And there's so many different avenues of risk now, whether it's new vulnerabilities that are being found or whether it's just the infrastructure you're working on, it is constantly changing. Yeah. You can't monitor every single thing because all of our applications are so dependent on other applications right. that if you're not watching it post-release, you just miss tons of real risk. Yeah, and also we're doing things like slow roll uh, upgrades and, and you know, we're rolling you know, A-B testing to, in order to figure out where the lift is gonna come from. Yeah. And, and that also results in us having a little bit of tech debt whenever we do these things, because we have to go and delete all the signals that all, all the all the old stuff that was deprecated yeah. by the winning promoting the winning uh, version of the test, but it's still it is far better than the situation we used to be in, where if you ship software every three months, <laughs> yeah. you know, so uh, you know it's it's a it's a it's a profound improvement. But what we're trying to do is take that next step, push the evolution one step further, so that the the journey monitoring that we can do tells us where the next hill is that we have to take. So Absolutely. we could say, uh, we, we shipped that change. Here was the, the traffic model yesterday at 10 a.m. We shipped this change at six in the morning. Let's watch it at 10 a.m. to make sure that it's either better or the same, but not worse. And you can roll things back and users don't even have to ever know they existed. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, we're, we're ending pretty close here on time. <laughs> Yeah, we, look, that's what happens. We get passionate, we start talking, right? Yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, kind of with that, I'll let that kind of be the closing note. I'm not sure if we have questions, if we have any time for questions. Yeah. We're, we're yeah, pretty we've close on a time, right? In. Yeah, yeah, we've got enough time for I think one or two questions here. So, and Perfect. we have have received a couple of questions. So let me dive right on into them. Um, here's the first one. Uh, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Is there a champion support group? <laughs> <laughs> We wow. actually have one at Sauce, uh, sort of. We, we have one, we have a thing called the uh, Extended Leadership Team, which is, uh, you know, there's the executive committee and then there's a team below that, kind of the director manager type. And it's not really a champion support group necessarily, but it's it's a leadership support group. And it's really it's really been beneficial, I think, to, to uh, those of us who are on it, um, hopefully I, to the company at large. I think even though it's tongue in cheek, it hit on a good point, which is yeah. don't don't try to do things alone. Uh, kind of ever, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but in right. this particular case, definitely don't try to do it alone because one, trying to drive cultural change can be very stressful. Um, and you know, it always helps to have other people, but two, 
at least for my purposes, I don't like making decisions entirely on my own because I feel like I'm wrong 20% of the time if I'm doing my job right. Mm -hmm. And if I have involved somebody else, maybe that cuts down to 2%. You know, because yeah. we're each wrong 20% of the time. So <laughs> collaborative on that. And it also, I, I think I brought up earlier the tribe, let me see if I can say it right, tribe guild squad model, yes. the Spotify model. Um, what I what I can absolutely see is a guild of champions. Um, yes. you, you know, people who say, I have stuck a stake in the ground and I've said, I'm going to take ownership of this. And whatever this is, people who have done that and stuck their neck out and put themselves you know, at a little bit of a situation of vulnerability and saying, I'm going to actually spend time and resource on this. They probably have a lot in common and maybe you form a guild of champions or something like that. I know. I mean, I'll share one anecdote. I don't think I can use the name of the company, but they make a, a very large CAD prop, prop, uh, mm-hmm. product. And the way they have it is each of their scrum teams has a security champion officially. And they have meetings of just the security champions to make sure that, you know, they're all up to date and that they're all, you know, keeping pace with the right policy changes, et cetera. So yeah. it's weird. They actually do basically have a champion support group. <laughs> so, yeah. so they do yeah. exist then. So yeah. it's too it's too much to think you have to have the right scale, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's too much to think that each squad could have its own security professional. I think uh, each squad doesn't typically even have its own testing resources in my experience. So yeah, Very a guild awesome. of yeah, that's great. I like that. I like that. Okay. Um we're four minutes to the top of the hour. Maybe we can just squeeze in one more question and then we'll close it out. Um, comparing the traditional and new normal changes in DevOps, how do you foresee it for the future or in the future? That's a lot to compress into like 30 seconds or less. So the, the, the first answer I've got, I'll try to keep it real short, is that you know we saw the peak earlier where it's traditional and then there's shift left, there's this peak of activity surrounding security and testing. What I want to see is a smooth line. I want to see that stuff be automated and woven throughout the process so that it's not, there aren't peaks. We have predictability, we have, you know, assured, uh, you know, processes that tell us whether or not things are working right. Um, what, what do you think, Jeffrey? I'm going to, I'm going to shift it a little bit because I agree with you on that. I don't, I don't want to just say I agree. Um, <laughs> there, there is this other aspect of like individual skill sets. And one thing I'm, I say all the time is software is becoming composed more than it is becoming coded. Yeah. And I think over time, you'll see less um, professionals focused on writing new code. And a lot more professional time is really spent on selecting and integrating and then managing the risk of basically composing your software out of all these other existing bricks. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can guarantee you that as a tester, I've written more code than, than most developers, right? Because they are stitching and yep. adding and editing <clears throat> and I'm creating it. And it's not, it, it's, it's a, uh, it's fascinating because when you talk to developers about what, whether or not they would want to go into testing, they don't want to t- tend, they tend not to want to go into testing, but it's like, that's where you're writing like all new code. Because <laughs> you're describing novel intent, which requires new code. You can't just stitch stuff together in that case. Exactly. So, fascinating. So maybe we'll see the rise of the code curator <laughs> position. Yeah, yeah. honestly, it's, it's, a lot of developers are basically doing that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I uh, you know I used to hire for can this developer write a brilliant algorithm, and I don't hire for that anymore. Now I hire for how resourceful are you? you know, mm-hmm. How, how adept are you at at stepping through an api and discovering new endpoints and making sure you can you can find things that you need to find uh, much more well, and collaborative way yeah. more than i used to that's well that's, this that's is a whole note. other conversation yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's a whole other webinar so i think that's we need right. to start planning for that one but listen uh we're we're a minute to the top of the hour so i i do need to cut this off i do appreciate uh everybody's uh, information and, and great questions that came in. Thank you very much uh, to the audience who did submit questions. I uh, want to real quick remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. 
just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, we are at the top of the hour, but I do have to do the drawing for the four $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, we're going to very, very quickly run through the names of the winners today. We have Elena T. Congratulations. Susie H. Congratulations. Richard S. Congratulations. And Julianne E. Congratulations. We'll be following up with all four of you by email to get your gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. Jeffrey Marcus, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Love to have a conversation with you anytime. Thanks again. Absolutely. Great. Thanks again, thank you guys. All right. All right, guys, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and uh, I am now signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe. Thanks. Goodbye.